So welcome to the uh, Bitbucket uh, Cloud Customizing Bitbucket with Forge webinar. Uh, this is our first kind of public demonstration of Forge running inside Bitbucket Cloud. And we are extremely excited to be showing everyone what we're doing, what we've been up to, um, give you a bit of a sneak peek into what we will have coming down the pipe. Um, and yeah, give you guys a chance to actually build something in Forge um, and ideally start to sort of build a bit of a, a relationship where you guys can um, give us feedback and we can make sure that we build the best possible extensibility framework for all of you, uh, whether you are customers or whether you are partners, um, you're all sort of the key people that we need involved in this. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, quick high level kind of um, spiel before we get started. So at Bitbucket, we have the vision of creating the industry's most extensible cloud SCM and CICD product. This is where we want to aim for. Um, I, I'm here uh, representing a few teams. So for anyone who missed it at the beginning, my name is Edmund Monday. I'm a senior product manager on Bitbucket Cloud. I represent three teams primarily, and those teams work heavily around our extensibility framework. Uh, and those teams also uh, the owners of Bitbucket Pipelines, which is our CICD uh, solution. So those teams have been working like mad for close to 12 months now to bring Forge into Bitbucket Cloud. Uh, we're really excited about what we're going to do with that. And if I could move slides, that would be great. So at a high level, our vision for Bitbucket Cloud uh, when it comes to Forge and extensibility is this concept that we've um, referred to as the dev operating system. What that means effectively is that we want people to be able to look at Bitbucket Cloud, not just as a product, but as a platform. So we want it to be a place where either customers or partners can use the core source control and CI CD features that we build into Bitbucket Cloud, but then build on top of that new and exciting capabilities either to you know, provide to the market through the marketplace, or if you're a larger customer or just a customer who has more bespoke requirements, you could actually build your own features on top of the core Bitbucket Cloud experience. And this is something that we think is really exciting and, and, and really differentiates what we're doing at Bitbucket compared to some of the other solutions in the market. We know that big, complicated customers, especially, have use cases and requirements that potentially no other company in the world might have. And so giving you guys the ability to actually build your own tools, your own capabilities on top of the core Bitbucket experience is really, really powerful. And Forge is a unique tool which allows us to give you the capability in a way which is easy to use, it's secure. It's safe, it's performant, and it lets you build things that feel like they're native functionality. This is a high level kind of like picture of like, you know, kind of what we're thinking in terms of the long term view for Bitbucket Cloud when it comes to extensibility. I'm not going to go through all of this in detail because this is um, very high level sort of conceptual, but we have these kind of core concepts that we refer to as events, gates, hooks, state, functions, and UI. Uh, and these elements are what we are using to create this workflow, this kind of um, this, this pipeline capability throughout Bitbucket Cloud. And this is not all gonna be available in the lease. It's definitely not all available now, but this is the vision of where we're heading to. And you'll see here, there's a common pattern where at different steps in the workflow, we have this sort of uh, grouping of capabilities. There's this concept of a gate, which basically will allow you to control whether or not a user can continue down the workflow. So for example, um, we have something like uh, pre-merge checks. You'll be able to write a capability, a, a Forge app that will block people from merging code unless a set of conditions are met. Hooks are, as, they, you know, as you would be familiar with from any other coding concept, it's basically ways for you to inject your own custom functionality into the core workflow and extend the uh, core business logic that Bitbucket Cloud has with your own business logic, either as an, as an app developer or as a customer. Functions are just a core part of the Forge capability, the ability to um, run your own code hosted in the Forge platform um, and execute logic that is sort of um, defined by you, either as a customer or as a partner. Um, I did see a hand go up. I'm not sure if I'm able to let people um, answer, ask questions. Um, if you do have a question, please jump into the Slack channel and ask it there. Um, I will quickly, oops, that was the wrong button to click. Sorry. I did post those links at the beginning, but I know what Zoom is like, it may have lost them. So I'm going to post those links in the Zoom chat again. If you have questions, please go to that. Sorry. Go to that link and join the Slack 
group and then go to the channel workshop customizing Bitbucket with Forge. Um, ask your questions in the chat there and we'll be able to answer them. We've got a few people in the chat helping out. Um, so yeah, sorry, functions is just core part of the Forge functionality, which allows you to run your own uh, code in the Forge platform. State similarity similarly is part of the Forge platform, it gives you the ability to store data and you can share that across the workflow. And then UI extensibility again is a core Forge capability, which allows you to add your own front end functionality into the uh, product as well. So time to actually build something. We're going to jump into that. Uh, I'm going to this and I'm going to go here. So here we have my Bitbucket Cloud workspace. Um, I am hoping everyone can see that. If you can't see that, please post something in the Slack channel and I will fix something. But to me, you can all see that. This is my Bitbucket Cloud workspace. And today we're going to be creating a very simple little app uh, that we call a Karma bot. So at Atlassian, we have this uh, simple little kind of utility where it just lets developers kind of recognize each other for the good work they've done. Uh, and the way it works basically is as a comment, um, you can oops, get rid of my test comments to start with. You can simply tag someone so I can say, oops, DJ, so DJ is the engineering manager. Um, and I can say plus plus plus. So basically what this is saying is, you know, you did a great job and I'm gonna give you some points. And these points are tallied, they are uh, stored in the system and they are shared across every single PR, they're shared across all the screens. And the idea is it's just a long running way of kind of tracking points and a way of sort of recognizing people did good things. Uh, and so I think there are some people at last year who have literally like you know, 20 to 30,000 of these, these karma points. Um, what we're gonna be building today is a very simple version of this karma bot. So you will be able to go into a pull request, you'll be able to tag a user and either you know do plus 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 or minus 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 and you can do as many pluses and minuses as you like it will give people more points the more you give them um and what we will do is there'll be a little forge function that runs in the background it will listen for this comment it will calculate the amount of points the user that you tagged has now so that will be looking at points they've been given in the past plus the points you just gave them then It'll update that amount that's been stored in the storage uh, so that next time someone gives them points, it'll sort of remember. And then it'll post a comment back to Bitbucket Cloud as a reply to the original comment, basically saying how many points the person has. If you try to give yourself points, it will not let you. It will actually tell you off for trying to give yourself points. So this is what we're going to build today. Simple little app, which does, you know, uh, lets you comment on someone, give them some points, and it will reply with how many points they have. But it actually demonstrates almost all of the core parts of the Forge experience. The only thing that this does not demonstrate is the UI extensibility. We do have some UI extension points available in Forge at the moment, but we'll not be explaining, we'll not be going through those today just because we won't have time. So that may be a topic for a future webinar is to sort of extend this app uh, to add some UI extension points. Um, so please stay tuned for that. All right, so what I'm gonna do, two seconds. All right. So just to confirm before we start, everyone will have has created a Bitbucket Cloud workspace. You have all got a repository in that workspace with a pull request on it. And if you are the only user in your workspace, you have uh, added my little test user from uh, the Slack message into your workspace. So you better tag me um, on your comment. You should also have set up, uh, completed the getting started with Forge process. So you'll have the Forge CLI installed, you'll have Docker installed, and you will have um, an up-to-date version of Node.js, either 16 or 18 uh, installed. And you will have an IDE that you're comfortable writing some JavaScript in. Okay, so first step in this process is I am gonna just jot something down um, when I can get my IDE to open. So I'm gonna be using um, WebStorm as my IDE you can use VS Code, that's perfectly fine. And for now, I'm just gonna create a new file and we're just gonna do some planning. And I'm gonna zoom, zoom in because hopefully everyone can see the text size. If you are having trouble with the text size, uh, please just post something in Slack. So first step is we're gonna create a bit of a plan for our app. So Forge apps have a kind of a core workflow that they all tend to follow. So whenever you're planning a Forge app, there's a few things you need to think about. Um, so the first thing, 
that you need to think about with any Forge app is probably the events that you're going to listen to. So all Forge apps fundamentally are what we call event driven. So they listen for events coming from Bitbucket Cloud, they respond to those events, uh, and then you run logic based on those events. Now, not everything in Forge is event driven. If you have UI extension points in Forge, that tends to be um, like user action driven. But if you are running some automation or your own logic in the background, it will usually be event driven uh, based on what we call business events coming from the product. So the first thing to do is um, kind of plan out what events you're going to need to listen to as part of your app. Now for ours, it's pretty simple. There's only one thing we really need to listen to, and that is when a comment uh, is created. So we want to listen to when a comment is created. Once you've defined the events that you want to listen to, um, you can get your indentation correct, um, you will need to think about, well, once those events have happened, what do you want to do? So you will need to think about probably some functions that you want to run, or at least what the functions that you're going to create are going to do. So in our context, there's a few things we need this function to do. The first thing we need to do when it responds to the uh, comment created event is it's going to get the comment data. Now, events coming from Bitbucket Cloud do not contain a huge amount of data in them. They tend to just be um, sort of the, the, the IDs of the relevant entities and records. Uh, and that is just so that you always get the most up-to-date version of that data. You, and you do that by calling back to the Bitbucket API with those IDs to get the information that you need. Um, and I just realized that my camera is very dark. That's because it is being... Hopefully people can see a little bit better now. So we're going to need to get comment data once the um, comment created event has occurred. And then we're going to need to parse the score the data in the data in that comment to get the score changes for people. So if they've been given points, if they've had points taken away from them, we're going to need to calculate those changes. We're then going to need to read the existing score for any users mentioned from Forge Storage, because we're going to be storing each person's score in the Forge Storage uh, feature. Um, and then we will need to update those scores in Forge Storage with the new values. So if they've been given points that had points taken away, we'll need to update those values in Forge Storage. And then the last thing we'll need to do is we'll need to send a comment back to Bitbucket as a reply to the original one with the new scores. That's kind of the high level view of what this uh, app is gonna need to do. Now, if I were adding UI extensibility, I would probably add a separate section down here basically just to say, well, look, I want some UI extension points, but we're not adding any UI extension points this time around. So I'm not gonna worry about that. And as you can see, this is not actually code. This is just a plan for me, for us, but it's always a good idea to start something like this whenever you're building a Forge app, just to get your thinking straight. And so you know what events you need to listen to, you know what, func what your functions are gonna need to do. And what you'll find later on is that we start, when we start talking about um, things like the Forge manifest file, the manifest file will mirror this in terms of its structure quite closely. So hang on to that plan for later. Um, so you can use it when you're, plan you're building your app. All right, so first thing we're gonna do, we're actually gonna start building something now. So I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna go there. And now, unfortunately, I don't think I can make, I can't make this bigger because it is my terminal. Uh, so if you can't see what happens on my screen, I apologize, but I will be pasting, I will be copying all of the commands into the Slack chat so you can grab them. But the first step, whenever you're creating a uh, Forge app, is going to be running the forge create command. So forge create. Actually, maybe let me just see if I can. Okay, yeah. So forge create. And what you will see on screen is creating an app in your current directory slash whatever your user is. Um, and then you need to give your app a name. So I'm going to call this uh, forge karma bot uh, demo day. And then you press enter. The next thing you're going to be faced with is going to ask you to select a template. Um, so for this, I am just going to go show all, and then I'm going to go blank because I don't want to use a template at the moment. We don't have a whole lot of templates in there for Bitbucket Cloud at the moment, but we will be adding plenty of those in the future. So please stay tuned for that. You should see a thing on screen saying they've created your uh, app. Your app is ready to work on, deploy, and install. We created three environments you can deploy to production, staging, and development, change to directory whatever, to see your app files. All right, so now that that is done, I can get out of the tiny little edit, the tiny little terminal that I'm sure none of you can actually read. And I can open. 
within that directory out. Okay. Thank you, Ulrich. You can see I'm a product manager, not a developer. And this is why I should pay more attention to the Slack chat and make things bigger. There'll be more terminal commands and I will remember for those ones. Thank you. All right, so now we are in a nice empty project. You should have a git ignore that will be set up. You should have a manifest.yaml file and you should have this source directory with index.js inside it. So first thing I'm gonna do just as a little bit of house cleaning, I am going to move that Coupled, that's not what I wanted. I am going to initialize a Git repository, that is Git init. I am also going to initialize uh, npm. So I'm gonna run npm init, and I've already not done what? There we go. Uh, and with the npm init, I am just gonna leave all the defaults same because I don't really want to change these. It just gives me that sort of package.json file which we will need because we're going to be installing some uh, node modules. Come on, Webstone, what are you doing? All right, that is all done. Thank you. So you should now have a package of JSON with all this stuff set up in there like that. What we're going to do, we're going to open up the manifest.yaml file and we're going to run through this super quickly. So in here, this is basically where um, you tell the Forge platform how you want your app to work. So you'll see here that there's an app ID. Now this is unique to your individual app. So uh, don't change this, otherwise it will break things. You can see here this module section and then function and then uh, a function that has already been defined with this index.run. We're gonna change all this in a section. So you don't need to go into it too much right now. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment when we need to make some changes. So what we are going to do First is we're going to create a function that we want to run in response to comments being created in Bitbox Cloud. Before we do that though, I'm just going to uh, do one last thing. So I'm going to go back to my terminal and we actually created a simple little um, library, NPM library that has just some helper functions for this um, project just to pull out some of the business logic, which is not really Forge related and make this uh, webinar actually fit inside 90 minutes. So get you to go to the terminal and go npm i bitbucket comma helpers. So I'll grab that and I will share that in Slack. So just install that npm package. And before we kick off, I'm gonna do one more as well. I'm gonna go npm i at forge slash API because we'll be using some functions from the Forge API library as well as part of this. So please also run that to install the Forge API library. So that you should have two libraries. You have the Bitbucket Karma, Karma helpers and the Forge API library. All right, we're gonna jump in and we're going to create our first bit of code. So up here in source, I'm actually gonna delete this index.js file because we don't want this one for right now. And I'm gonna create a new file called comment.js. I'm gonna zoom in. And in here, we're just gonna create what we call a handler. So every Forge function, um, so every Forge app has to have what we call a handler function. This is the function that gets called whenever the Forge runtime basically wants to invoke the app. So we'll be invoking it in response to um, some events. So inside this file, I'm just gonna set up a pretty much an empty function. Um, let me zoom out a tiny bit so you can see what's going on. Uh, and this is just gonna basically take an event and some context. So these are provided by the Forge platform. And initially it's just gonna log the event out so that we can see what's actually going on. Now, what is important in here is I've created this uh, function and I've given it a name uncreated and it's in the comment file. This is just a logical naming convention. You don't need to follow this exactly. You can kind of call this whatever you like, but try to make it something logical so that um, you can sort of reference it back later on and it will make sense. Um, throughout this, I'll be sharing some code and a lot of that code will have comments attached to it. Um, don't 
worry about the comments. You don't sort of need to know exactly what they're doing. It basically is just designed to uh, give you some little handy things like auto completion and type hints without you having to use TypeScript. So we do, you can use TypeScript to build forge functions, but you do not need to. Um, we didn't want to for this demonstration just because it adds an additional layer of complexity. So those comments that you see up above all the functions are just basically giving us some hints um, without you having to write TypeScript. So don't worry too much if you don't know what they mean. Everything you need to use those has been included in the um, Forge Karma Helpers library. So that's going to be the first part of our function. And we're going to actually test that now to make sure it all works. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the manifest.yaml file and we're going to wire up Forge to run this function whenever a comment is created on a pull request. So I'm going to go back to manifest.yaml and we're going to add in all the parts we need in order to do that. So under modules, you see that this function with uh, the handler index.run and the key my function. So we're just going to update this to match the new logic we created. So the key can be anything, but I'm going to call it on comment created like that. And the handler does need to be specific. Sorry. Mm. So the handler needs to be formatted like the file name you just created. So for example, it should be comment and then dot and then the name of the function that you exported and make sure that the function was exported, so uncreated. So I go back here. That is the handler for this function, comment dot uncreated, because it's the comment file and then the uncreated function that was exported. Now notice that this assumes the code that you wrote for your handler is inside the source directory. So you do need it to be in the source directory in order for it to find it. So basically what we've done here is we've defined uh, a key for this function and we've told Forge, whenever we reference this on comment created function, we want you to go into the comment file and run the on created function. So what we need to do now is basically tell Forge when we want it to run this function. And to do that, we're going to use the uh, trigger element inside the manifest.yaml. So underneath modules still, we're going to define a trigger like this. And that trigger is going to have a key as well. And we're going to say, we're going to give this a slightly different name. Um, so we're going to say all request uh, commented. So that is the uh, key we're giving to this trigger. We reference it later. We're going to tell it what uh, function we want it to run whenever this trigger is invoked. So that is this that is the on comment created function. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to tell it what events from Bitbucket are used to trigger this trigger or to execute this trigger. So we're going to say events. And then the event that we are looking for is this guy here. And I will put this in the chat in two seconds, is that. So the Bitbucket created pull request comment event. Now you see here that events is pluralized. So you can actually have multiple different events all run the same trigger. Um, if you want your app to run in response to multiple things, you can also have multiple triggers and multiple functions. That's perfectly fine. Um, but this is the one we're using today. So just to recap, so we've defined a function with the key on comment created. And we've told it that the code to run is in the comment file, the uncreated function. Then we've defined a trigger with the key pull request commented. We've told it to run the on comment created uh, function, which is this guy. And then we've told it to run in response to this event, the bitbucket pull request commented event. So give me two seconds and I'll put all of this into the Slack chat for anyone who's following on. So that is what your um, manifest.yaml should look like in Slack. And now last thing we need to do in the manifest of YAML before we finish up here is we've told Forge that your app is listening to this pull request comment event, but we haven't actually given your app permission to read that data yet. So there is some data related to the pull request that's included in that event. Um, and your app needs to have the permissions to actually read that data before it will be allowed, uh, before it will be sent that, that information as part of the event. So to do that, we're going to add one last section into the manifest.yaml, which is a permissions. Oops, sorry, no, that goes above modules. Yeah, 
add emissions. And we're going to add scopes. And then we're going to add a particular scope, this, which is the read pull request bitbucket scope. So this tells Forge that the app has permission to read pull request information from Bitbucket. And I'll pop all this in Slack as well. So we've now given your app permissions it needs to be able to read the data coming from the event. So just to quickly recap where we're up to and what we've done, we have created a JavaScript file for working with comments. We've created and exported this uh, on created function. And all that does is it takes in an event and some context and it logs out the event. So the event is basically the uh, information coming from Bitbucket related to what happened. Context is just a standard Forge um, object that includes some information related to the Forge uh, workspace and the runtime, which is just useful for um, getting information about where your function is running and other information that it needs. And then in the manifest of YAML, we've said we've defined a function which calls that comment on created function. We've given it a key. We've then defined a trigger which invokes that function and listens for this event. And then we've given your app the permissions to read the pull request data from Bitbucket. So you've actually done most, probably the most complicated part of this whole thing already. This is actually most of the hard part. We're actually ready to, to test this now. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to run a quick end-to-end -end test to make sure that everything is all working the way it should be. So before we can do that, you need to do a few things. The first thing we need to do is we need to deploy your app into the Forge platform. So to do that, we just go Forge, deploy in your terminal, and you hit enter. And this will take a little second. It's going to run some linting, and then it is going to deploy to the platform. And while that is running, I'm going to quickly check Slack to see if there's anything in there. Nope, good. And that's now deployed. So hopefully yours ran that fast. Um, so basically what this has done is it has taken your code, it's bundled it up, uh, it's run some validations over it, and it has deployed it to the Forge platform in development mode. And this allows you to run some tests. Before we can do that though, we need to install that app uh, into a workspace. So what you will need to do, uh, you will need to go and get the workspace URL or the workspace that you're working in. So that is basically bitbucket.org slash and then the first section after the first slash. So for example, for me, that is bitbucket.org slash emonday underscore Atlassian. So I'll put that in the slide as, a, uh, as an example. So that is my workspace URL. You will need to go and get your workspace URL so that you can install the app in your workspace. To do that, you go forge install at dash p. Bitbucket. The dash p Bitbucket is basically telling it what product you want it to want to install this in. Um, the Jira and Confluence they actually show up as part of a menu when you go Forge install. But because Bitbucket is not actually officially released yet for Forge, um, it does not show up in that list. So you need to specify uh, Bitbucket with the dash p. So that is now in the Slack channel as well. So it is going to ask you to input your workspace URL. So grab your workspace URL and add that in. So for me, that is bitbucket.org slash emonday underscore Atlassian. Um, you notice that the prompt it gives you says enter your site, for example, your domain.atlassian.net. That is the correct structure for Jira and Confluence because Jira and Confluence run on uh, subdomains. Bitbucket does not run on subdomain of the Atlassian.net uh, URL. So the workspace is actually in the URL path. So kind of just ignore that um, the example uh, site domain that it gives you, we are updating that. Um, yours will be something like bitbucket.org slash you know, emonday underscore Atlassian. It will now ask you, it will now tell you the scopes that are being granted to your app and basically just ask you to confirm that they're okay. So I'm gonna go Y, enter, and then it is installing the app into that workspace. Cool, your app in, your app in the development environment is now installed into Bitbucket on that URL. So. In theory, that app should now be installed. It should be ready to go. It should be ready to test. Uh, if anyone is having any problems, please post it in Slack and we'll try and help you out. And I just clicked the wrong button. There we go. So in order to test it, what we're going to do is we're going to use what's called the Forge Tunnel. 
which is basically it's a really powerful tool that makes your local development experience super easy. Um, and it basically lets you uh, stream in your logs from uh, an app running in a workspace uh, in real time. It also lets you make changes to your code and test that effectively in real time as well without having to do uh, more deployments. So I am going to go forge. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Forge. Tunnel, like that. And I'll copy that. Uh, just note, you do need to have the Docker client running to run Forge Tunnel. So if you haven't got the Docker client running, please do that. And then Forge Tunnel is the command. Now, this may take a minute or two, depending on your internet connection, uh, because if you haven't got the relevant Docker image uh, installed on your machine, you will need to download that Docker image before it can run. Um, so please be, be patient with that. Once that's installed and it is up and running, it will basically give you a live feed of any logs coming from your app in Bitbucket. So what you'll see when it's ready to go is you'll see this listening for requests prompt in the terminal. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to my browser and I'm now in Bitbucket Cloud. And I'm just going to leave a comment just saying hello world. It doesn't need to do anything else. And I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to go back to my IDE. And if I've done it right, I should get a feed in. I've done something silly. Two seconds. You know it's a live demo when parts of it don't work. Probably doing something silly. Wendy, if you can think about what I'm doing, which is probably silly, then let me know. Um, So I'm just going to redeploy this. I'm going to reinstall it with an updated manifest file. And hopefully that'll make it work. That's interesting. See, uh, I'm not really sure what that is. Give me two seconds. Sorry. Sorry, everyone, just uh, some real time debugging.
So I just need to run the forge upgrade command and I've gotten the last export. So just getting that prompt now. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks for happened today. I get nervous and stressed. I forget to see a like on or to install upgrade. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Now let's try that again. Forge panel. So I've got all the scopes. So in, every, in, in, in theory, this should be fine. All right, let's try it again. And let's see if the demo god's going to be kind to me today. It's always the case with working. I'm just trying to debug whether there's an issue with the extra bridge itself for some reason, um, or if it's something else. So apologies, everyone. This is working literally half an hour before the thing started. Okay, so it looks like there might actually be an issue with the Forge bridge at the moment, because I just checked the developer console, which I will show on my screen here. And I can see that there are requests coming through um but it is not showing up in the forge bridge now i'm wondering if i've seen strange behavior with things like this where zoom calls particularly sharing screen on zoom calls can cause all kinds of strange behavior with network requests and because we are proxying all these network requests through to my machine locally I'm wondering if the Zoom call might actually be causing it to not come through to my laptop. So I am going to push on with this, uh, noting that I'm pretty sure I can't actually show you in my terminal that there what's going on with the Forge tunnel. So what I will try to do is uh, deploy things as I go, and then I'll try to show you in the uh, developer console as things are happening. So apologies about this, everyone, um, but we will push on anyway. So if you give me two seconds, I'm going to try and just confirm some things. So this is the developer console uh, that we that, that you should all have access to. So you can go to developer.lesson.com, uh, and then you can go up here and go to developer console. Uh, and inside the developer console, it will actually show you all the apps you have deployed to Forge. So this one here, BBC App Day Test, is one that I'm currently working with now. Um, and I can go to logs and I can go to development and it'll show me all the logs from the last one hour. 
Um, and so I can see here process comment and then the ID and process comment event, which is here. So I'll have to just kind of run off this for the time being, I think. Um, all right. So, but you can trust me and believe me that this is actually working because that is the event that came through. You can see it there. Uh, and then that is just the uh, comment that we left, which maps up to the code here that we logged. So it is all coming through. All right, let's continue and hope we don't have any more of those kinds of hiccups. That would be lovely. So we've tested that the app is running and that when we create a comment in Bitbucket, it is going and running that code because we saw the event being logged and we saw this process comment event being added to the logs as well. So now we're going to go and we're going to add in some business logic to actually run our little Karma bot. So the first thing we're going to do is in comment JS, we're going to check to confirm that the comment that was created was created by a user uh, and not by anything else. The reason we want to do this is because we want to make sure that we don't reply to our own comments because we are going to go and we're going to leave a comment uh, in the bucket once we're done that replies to the original one and tells the people what their score is. So the way we're going to do that, very simple. Uh, we're just going to go in and we're going to say, if the event actor type is not a user, uh, basically just return and bail out. And apologies, that's a little, uh, that's my not equals uh, symbol that my web, that my um, WebStorm instance is showing you. If you're not familiar with that, it's just uh, exclamation point equals equals. I forgot to turn that off for this demo. So I'm going to put that now in the chat. So if you're following along at home, you can grab that. Yes, thank you, Victor. Appreciate that. That's that's where I think we're going to be running off for the rest of tonight. So that's room for them. So what that would do basically is just make sure that the uh, event was created by a real user rather than by um, our own app. Now what we're going to do is we are going to need to work with the event that's come through. Uh, now you can just you, you can just work with the raw event that comes through as an object, but to make life a little bit easier, uh, we've just created some utilities for working with that event as part of the Bitbucket Karma Helpers um, library. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the pull request commented event class from the Bitbucket Karma Helpers library, uh, and I'm just going to convert the event to an instance of that class, just so it's easier to work with because there's some helper functions stuff like that on there. So I'm going to I'll copy all this. And that just makes that a little bit nicer to work with later on. Now, the next step we need to do is we need to get all of the actual data for the comment, because as I said before, the comment event does not include all of the information about it. It just includes the IDs of the relevant um, yeah, objects like the comment and the pull request and things like that. So we need to go back to Bitbucket and we need to get all of that um, additional comment data. So to do that, we're going to create another file. We're going to go into source and we're going to create a new file. And we're just going to call this API JS, and this is where we're going to put um, all of our API calls that we need to make back to Bitbucket. Now, um, make sure that you have the at forge slash API library installed. Uh, and then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the API function and the route function from the forge API library. And then we're going to just build a function that calls out to Bitbucket and gets the full information of the comment that the event was for. So this is the code for that. It's just called fetch comment. We export it. It takes in the event that came from Bitbucket. And then it uses the uh, Forge API to call back to Bitbucket and get all the information. So I'm going to put this into the chat, and then I'm going to walk through this code and just explain what it all does. So we're using the API. Uh, function from the Forge API library. And then onto that, we're chaining the as app method. So the as app method is a really useful feature, which basically lets you use the um, authentication identity of your Forge app when talking to the Bitbucket API. So you don't need to do, you don't need to worry about you know, tokens. You don't need to do any kind of um, you know, OAuth uh, you know, dance as people call it to get yourself token. It's all handled by the Forge runtime. 
you just use api.asapp and it handles the authentication for you. Um, there's another version of this, which is I think as user, and that's useful when you're building front-end apps and you want to inherit the authentication uh, of the user that is currently using the app. Um, and that also lets you use their authentication credentials rather than having to manage it. So this effectively removes possibly the biggest complexity of building applications um, in that it just makes the authentication component of it just go away. You don't have to think about it. You just use this method. And then onto that, we chain this request Bitbucket method, which is basically just saying that we want to call the Bitbucket API. Um, and then into that, we're going to use this route function to build up our uh, API um, URL that we're going to call. So everything that you pass into this route function is just basically the, um, uh, the API route using the standard REST APIs um, to get the comment that was sent through. So we interplate some values into here. We get the workspace ID, the repository ID, uh, and the pull request ID, and then the comment ID, and then we're adding some fields onto the end to tell it what we want it to get. Um, and it will call back to Bitbucket. It'll get that comment, and it will return it to us. So I will put all of this into, sorry, put that into Slack. So then a response from that is going to come back. And then it has a, a JSON method on the response, which we need to call basically just to parse the response back from JSON. So this will grab the comment and then it will return it to us so that we can work with it. So now back in the comment.js file, we're going to import this that we just created. So import, and then I say fetch comment from API.js. And if you're like me, make sure that your ID imports it correctly because sometimes it doesn't. And then we're going to add that to our code here. And we're going to wrap that in a try catch block because anytime you call an API, you can sometimes have issues. So we're going to wrap that in a try catch block to catch any errors. And then if there's an error, we're just going to return. Basically, means we're going to bail out of running this because without comment, we can't really progress any further. So we want to stop uh, the forge function from running. So now we should have the full details of the comment that we need. So next up, we need to check the score changes that were uh, provided in the comment from the user. Now, this is not anything forge related. It's basically just chopping up the string that is in the comment, uh, doing a bunch of regex passes on it to figure out how many uh, points the person gets or loses. So we've actually just pulled all that out and we've added it into the Bitbucket Karma Helpers library so that you don't need to sort of build that yourself right now. Um, if you are interested in the code for any of this stuff, by the way, the repo is linked in the Slack thread uh, at the top. Um, all of these helper functions that I'm using from the NPM package are in the helpers folder inside that uh, repository. So um, you can look at this stuff if you want to, we're just not using it right now because it's just a lot of regex patterns and it would take us a while to build. So I'm going to import find karma instructions from the Bitbucket Karma Helpers library. So just update the existing import statement that you've got. And then down below, we are going to call that function. And into that function, we're going to pass the raw output of the comment. So that is comment.content.raw. So that is just the raw string value from the comment that was created in Bitbucket Cloud. And what this is going to do is it's going to basically chop that up. It's going to look for the scores and it's going to return an array of what we call karma instructions. Uh, karma instructions is such an object uh, that basically has the, uh, I, the user ID and the change in that user ID's score, so a plus or a minus. And I just need to quickly change something in here for everyone's benefit. I'm going to install something to automatically format my code quickly so that it is all nice and pretty and no one needs to worry about me doing silly things and like forgetting a semicolon. There we go. All right, so now we have a list of comment instructions. That'll be an object with the user ID and the changes in their uh, score. So now what we need to do is we need to actually update the score based on those changes. So the score is being stored in the uh, forge storage uh, feature. So we need to create some logic to set and get scores from the forge storage. So we're going to create another file and we're just going to call this storage.js. 
This is the this will be where we're interacting with Forge Storage. And in here as well, we're going to import storage from the Forge API library so that we can interact with Forge Storage. So for anyone who's not familiar with Forge Storage, it's basically like a super lightweight database which is built into Forge. And it lets you share data across um, any single installation of a particular app. So if you have an app installed in one workspace and you save some data to the Forge Storage, that same app can access that data from anywhere within that app installation. It doesn't share data across apps or across installations. Um, and that's for obvious you know, security and privacy reasons. There are other features which let you share information across apps. Uh, that's like uh, entity, the, the entity API, entity storage API, I think it's called. Uh, sorry, properties. Entity properties, I think is the correct word for it. Um, and that lets you store information against uh, business entities in the product. But for right now, we want to store this data against the app so that we can share it across, say, multiple requests. So I'm just going to copy and paste the code for this file into here, and then we will walk through it together. And I'll share that in Slack as well. So we've imported the storage function from Forge. We're going to create a little helper function just called get karma, and that takes a user ID. And that is just going to call storage.get and pass in the user ID. So we're going to be using the user ID as the key in the Forge storage uh, for setting and getting their scores. If it doesn't find anything with that user ID, it's just going to return zero because we're going to assume that this is the first time that a particular user has been um, referenced in the karma bot. And so this score would be zero by default. We're then also going to have a set karma function which takes a user ID and the amount. So what we want to set that karma amount to, and that's just called storage.set user ID, uh, and then passes in the amount. And then lastly, we have the update karma function. So this is where a lot of the, you know, the, the logic is, a lot of the meat. Uh, and so this is going to take one of those karma instructions that we mentioned before. It's going to take the uh, comment itself, and what it's going to do first is it's going to get the current karma score for the user that we're looking at. So it's going to call get karma and pass in the instruction.user uh, property. If the user is giving themselves points, um, we are not going to update the score in Forge Storage because we don't want people to be able to give themselves additional points. We're just going to return an object containing the user's ID and their current score. If the user is not giving points to themselves, so they're giving points to someone else. We are going to create this next variable, which is basically just the current score, which we got up here, plus the change in the score that was pulled from the instruction. Now, the change can be a minus or a positive number. That's fine. This will work. We then want to set that user's score to that next amount. And then we want to return an object in the same shape, so user, which will be their user ID, and then the new score as the score value. So that way, what comes back from this, no matter whether it's a user giving themselves points or whether it's a user giving someone else points, we're going to get back to the same object of a user and their updated score. So all the code for that is in Slack. Just make sure that you import the storage function before once you add it in. And then we are going to go back to comment.js and we are going to use this. So uh, I'm going to import um, update karma from storage.js. And then down here, sorry, one second. Sorry, I forgot a step. What we're also going to do, sorry, is uh, in source, we're going to create a new file and we're going to call this one karma.js. Sorry, I skipped a step. In here, we're going to import the update karma function we just created. So this is going to be our uh, all our karma specific logic. And then in here, we're going to define another function that we just call update karma scores. So if you remember back to here, comment.js, we've actually got an array of these karma instructions, not a single one. 
So the update karma scores function is going to take that array and it's just going to iterate over that array and it's going to return a list of the karma scores, which are those objects we created before with user ID and their updated score. So I'm going to grab, so make a comment. I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to, instead, I'm going to import update karma scores from karma.js. And then down here, I am going to call that function and I'm going to save the output to this karma scores variable. Uh, make sure you await that because it is async. So anything, anytime you're working with the forge uh, storage API, it is always uh, async. So make sure you await that and then we should be good. So what we'll have at the end of that is an array of karma scores objects. Okay, so then the next step in all of this is we need to generate a reply to send back to Bitbucket Cloud uh, and post as a comment on the initial comment. So at this point, we have calculated the change in score We've saved the updated score back to the Forge storage. Uh, and we've now got a bunch of objects that contain the updated score for each user. So now we need to send that data back to Bitbucket as a reply to the original comment um, to basically tell the people that were given points what their new score is. So the first step in this we have done in the helper library, which is the generate karma reply function. So just go back up to the top in comment.js and import the generate karma reply function. So the top of your comment.js file should now look a bit like this. Uh, yeah, sure, sorry, I forgot to share that. That is my fault. So that is uh, karma.js, you see? Uh, and the bit I posted above that, that's just the input statements in comment.js, just to make sure you have it all aligned. Perfect. So in comment.js, you should have this generate karma reply function. We are going to go down. And we're going to say, Sorry, just moving my windows around so I can get all my notes. We generate a list of replies to send back. So we're going to pass in the karma scores and the comment. And this is just going to um, go through all of that, generate the replies to send back to the uh, user uh, and return that as a um, single string that will get sent back. So what this is doing behind the scenes is for each karma score, it's basically calculating, uh, generating a string, which basically just says the username and then has X karma points. Um, and we just inflate the values in. Uh, for any instances where the user is giving themselves points, it does not do that. It instead says something like, you know, don't, don't create self karmas. I think it says no self karmas for you. Um, so it's generated that list of strings. And because you can actually have multiple uh, karmas being awarded in a single comment, that it, it, it's grabbing each separate response and it's just joining them together as to what in one string with a new line character in between them. So it'll render it sort of nice and cleanly in the comment when it gets sent back to Bitbucket. So what comes out of that is just a string that will be added into a comment that goes back in Bitbucket and it will contain all of the updated karma scores for the people that were given points. So then, the last major step in this process is sending the reply back to Bitbucket to create the comment um, as a reply on the original one. So to do that, we're going to go back into uh, API.js um, and we are going to create a function for creating a comment in Bitbucket. Now I'm just going to copy and paste this code in here and then I'll put it in Slack as well and then we will walk through it. So this 
is now going in Slack. So just pop this underneath the uh, fetch comment function that we created earlier. And we'll walk through. So the reply to comment function takes the, the parent comment. Um, so the, sorry, let's see. Actually, yeah, so it takes the parent, the event, sorry, it takes actually the event that was uh, used to create the um, comment. Uh, and it takes the the new one, the, the reply string, actually for, for everyone's sanity, I might actually rename this to reply string. So it's a bit more explicit because otherwise it can get a bit confusing. So it takes the parent comment event and it takes the reply string, and then it's going to generate a new comment uh, using that. So we use the same route function that we used before to generate the URL. So we just pay it, pass in things like the workspace ID, the repository ID, the pull request ID, and then slash comments. And that generates the full URL. We then create the request body. So we have a content property and then a raw property, which is the reply string. And then we specify the parent of this comment by using the uh, parent.comment ID property that we're getting from the original event. Uh, so it knows to link this new comment as a reply to the one that was created originally. We then add that body into the request details and we specify this as a post request because we're creating something. And then we call, we use the API as app request bit bucket method. Uh, we pass in the request route that we generated up here. And we pass in the request details that we created here. And this will call back to the bit bucket API and create that new comment as a reply under the original one. All right. So now with this reply to comment function created and exported, we're going to go back to comment.js. We are going to import this. And then down here, we are going to call that function and Way. So we're going to pass in the comment event first and the comma reply second. So I will check this in Slack. So this is the uh, function we're calling down the bottom, and this is the updated import statement. Uh, and just so that everyone's on exactly the same page, I'm going to copy the entire file. Actually, I'm going to do one last thing. I'm going to go right down the bottom. And as a last step in all of this, we're going to go console log, process comment, and then the comment ID. So we know it's done. I'm going to grab this entire file and I'm going to put this into Slack. This is comment.js. And that's basically what you should have at the end of this process in comment.js. I'm going to share the code for the other files as well, so that if anyone has sort of fallen behind, you can just compare to that. So I'm going to grab api.js. So that is api.js. I'm going to grab comma.js. And lastly, I'm going to grab storage. And all of these are just in the, the root of the source directory. So if anyone has fallen behind, feel free to grab those and keep yourself up to date. Excellent. So that's actually pretty much it. So I'm going to run through this quickly again. So we've got this uncreated event, sorry, function that responds to the uh, comment created event. It's checking to make sure that the event was created by a user, otherwise it is returning. Um, it is just converting that event into an instance of this pull request comment to the event class that we created in the helper function just to make it a bit easier to work with. Um, we then are getting the details of the comments, the comment data, um, using the 
fetch comment function that we created, which calls the API. We are then using the find karma instructions function from the helpers to get a, an array of karma instructions that we use to update the scores. We are then going into this update karma scores uh, file, which basically just iterates over each of the karma instructions and for each of them updates the karma score for the user. So it, return, it does not give the user extra points if they're giving themselves karma, but it does give the user points if they're giving karma to someone else. And it just returns this object with their user ID and their current score. We then are using this generate karma reply function from the helper library, and that's being passed all of the karma scores and the original comment to generate this single string, which is the reply being sent back to Bitbucket. And then we use this reply to comment function that we created, passing in the parent. I might actually, again, I'll, I might change this to parent event, just to make it clear, because it's not the comment it's passing in, it's the event that created it. Um, passing in the event and the string we want to use for the comment, generating the URL, generating the body of the request, creating the full config of the request, and then using the Forge API functionality to make the request back to Bitbucket. And then finally, back in comment.js, we are calling that function. And then we are just making, we're doing a log at the end to say that it is all done. So what we're going to do now is we are going to test this again. Now, we're not going to use the Forge channel like I was planning to before. So we're just going to deploy this and uh, update your installation. Um, and then we will check in the logs. Well, actually, we shouldn't need to check logs because you should actually see this now commenting back in Bitbucket. So first up, I'm going to go um, forge. I'm going to go back to here because I keep forgetting this one. Forge install upgrade. And it's going to upgrade my installation of the app. And it is, actually, I need to, sorry. This was meant to break and it's meant to be like a, a whole learning moment where we now go and fix the, the error that it was having. But because of the previous issue with the Forge channel, I uh, don't have the error that I was meant to have now. So I'm just going to tell you all what I would have told you if this had gone according to plan. So uh, you probably don't have all three of these scopes in your manifest at YAML. You probably only have the read pull request bit bucket. Um, in my panic earlier uh, this evening, I went and basically just added everything in here to, in case I had forgotten to add the scopes and that was why I wasn't working. That wasn't why. So I was planning to get an error now which said, hey, you're missing some scopes. You need to update your um, manifest.yaml. And then we would have worked that together because I fixed this earlier in my panic. I didn't get that error. So I'm going to quickly share the updated manifest.yaml with you all in Slack. Um, the only changes are that I added the write pull request bitbucket scope and the storage app scope. So that is so that I can call back to the Bitbucket API to create the comment and so that I can use the uh, forge storage functionality here. So please update your uh, manifest.yaml to reflect what I have there. Uh, do not use my app ID. Sorry, I should not have included that in the when I sent to you. I will update that quickly. Uh, please use your app ID, the one that was in your original manifest.yaml file. You just update the scopes at the top, and then you should be all good. So once you've updated those scopes, then we will run forge install upgrade. And basically, what this is doing is, sorry, actually, no. Because you are changing scopes, you actually need to run forge deploy first. Apologies for going back and forth on that a little bit. So you will run forge deploy. Every time you change scopes, you need to redeploy, yeah, and then you will need to rerun the installation as well. So it will redeploy your app to the Forge platform. Give it a second. Oh, you should get a prompt saying it's been deployed. And then once that's done, you will need to run forge install dash dash upgrade. So that basically just tells forge to install the upgraded version 
of the app uh, into a workspace. And let me just put formatting around that. That will run and it should ask you what workspace you want to run the upgrade on. In theory, you should have only one option. Uh, so just press enter. It will upgrade the installation and it will then ask you, it will tell you that you're basically adding additional scopes to the uh, app. And this is basically you as the admin of that workspace um, consenting to those additional scopes being added to the app. So just go yes and enter. It'll upgrade your app in the dev environment. And your app in development environment is at the latest in Bitbucket on bitbucket.org. So your, sh your updated app should now be installed and ready to go. Did anyone get any errors or issues? I can see Tobias is typing. That is interesting, Tobias. Just a quick disclaimer, this is all pre-release. Um, we'll, we'll check that. All right, interesting. Leave that with us, we will review um and and make sure that's all correct um so thank you tobias we've had our first piece of really good feedback from the uh unofficial forge in bitbucket eap program uh, stay tuned for i'm sure plenty more of that on the bright side the fact that tobias has found that um edge case that was not what i expected means that i'm assuming the app is working so if you go back to uh, Bitbucket and you uh, say at, and I'm going to say DJ plus, 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 and I save that, um, the app will run um, and it should calculate some additional points for, for DJ. Um, and it should send a comment back to Bitbucket with the updated score. So if I reload the page and I scroll down, you can see here the app has replied with this at DJ has 11 comments. And if I add myself, and I add a bunch of those points, I say that. It will run again. And in theory, it should tell me that I'm doing something bad. Yeah, no self comments for you. So there you all have it. We have built our app. We have linked it up to the comment created event on the pull request. We've added the logic in to save the scores and retrieve the scores from the Forge storage API. We have also used those scores to write a comment back to the Bitbucket pull request to reply, tagging the user that was given some points and letting them know how many points they have in total. And the person tried to give themselves some points, but said no self comments for you. Don't, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't give yourself points. All right, six thirty. I couldn't think of something witty to say there. That's pretty much the conclusion of our little um, webinar. Just so everyone is aware, the code for all of this is available in the repo that was shared in Slack. It's at the top of the Slack channel. Um, the Yes, the recording will be uh, posted as soon as we have it. Um, the instructions for how to create it are included in um, a tutorial markdown file as part of the repository. And all of those uh, helper functions that we used are also just in a directory um, in the uh, that repository as well. So you can go in and see what's going on in there. There's nothing Forge related in there. It's just like some regex patterns and some, some loops. Um, but if you really care, you can go and have a look at that. Um, and yes, uh, great call out, Ulrich. Um, we will definitely be doing an addition, another one of these to go into UI. Um, just for everyone's context here, like we are planning to do a lot of these webinars um, over time, basically going into all the features, not just of Forge, but of the other things we're adding. Um, I'm just gonna quickly look at the comments. Do, do, do. So uh, Tobias, there is not public documentation uh, yet, just because this is not uh, released yet. We're planning to kind of go to like a public EAP probably in late July. Um, but I will talk to the team about getting the documentation available for the people on this call um, 
in the next few days, hopefully. We do have uh, documentation written internally. Um, just note, it's not going to be like super polished and, and complete. Um, we are still a little bit away off the release, but I'll, I'll make sure we get the documentation available for everyone here. Um, and yeah, we'll do another session covering some of the UI. Um, just for context, as of today, the UX, UI extension points we have are the um, little like right-hand side cards on the repository screen. Um, Wendy, jump in if I'm getting that wrong. So the cards that can pop up here, or maybe it's the pull request screen, one of those two. Um, and we have uh, a modal pop-out that triggers from an action that you can create in this menu. Um, but I believe we only have that on the pull request page, not the, sorry, on the repo page, not the pull request page. Um, we'll be adding a bunch more UI extension, extension points over the next four weeks. The repo plus pull request screen have the card on the right-hand side. The action is only on the repo page right now. Perfect. We'll be adding the uh, action pop-out to the pull request screen um, over the next couple of weeks. We'll also be adding the ability to adding full page um, screens at the repository level. Uh, as well as create settings screens in both the repository and the workspace uh, settings pages. Um, and that should be coming over the next couple of weeks, ready for a, sort of a, a wider EAP release later in July. Uh, and then we'll be looking to add some more stuff after that around pipelines. Ulrich raises an excellent question around merge checks. So we are working on what we call custom merge checks that will be powered by Forge. So that will be a module uh, built on top of this first brand, that first round of Forge functionality. And that will let you build custom logic that will be able to block the merging of code on pull requests. So that will be a kind of a hybrid of just core standard Forge functionality, plus some additional native functionality we're building into Bitbucket that will give uh, first class uh, custom merge checks, um, which will work very similar to the existing hard-coded merge checks on the pull request, but you'll be able to basically write your own as Forge functions um, and execute them. Um, you'll be able to also include like uh, UI extensions as part of that. So if you have a particularly complicated uh, configuration, which I know uh, Ulrich, you guys have some really cool stuff, you'll be able to add your uh, config into the settings of at the workspace level or at the repository level, uh, and then use those settings to execute the logic in the custom merge checks. Um, Something else that we'll have coming after that as well is we will be expanding those uh, checks, what we call up the hierarchy and down the workflow. So when we say up the hierarchy, we will be adding capability for customers to configure checks at uh, the project and the workspace level. Um, and we'll also be adding in checks, not just at the pull request for merging code, but we'll also be adding checks at uh, pre-pipeline. So you better run uh, checks before a pipeline executes and also pre-deployment. So if you want to run checks before a deployment executes in pipelines, you'll be able to have checks at those points as well. So we're expanding the concept of checks, not just at uh, pre-merge, but it'll be pre-pipeline and pre-deployment. Um, and you will be able to build uh, apps either as a customer to use that. You will also be able to build apps as a marketplace partner um, that, ex that use that functionality. Um, and the last piece we're working on right now related to Forge uh, is a new one that is not a officially publicly announced, but it is something that we're working on. Uh, and that is the concept of what we call dynamic pipelines. So that would be the ability to build a forge function that at runtime will generate the configuration to run a CI CD pipeline. So rather than all of your pipelines being configured uh, as static YAML in the repository, you will be able to generate them uh, dynamically at runtime using context about the repository and the code that's being changed. Uh, you will also be able to do a hybrid of both, where if you have a pipeline written as YAML, but you also have a dynamic pipeline configured on the repository, uh, the dynamic pipeline can take that static YAML as a, an argument we pass into it, and then it can make mutations to that YAML dynamically uh, at runtime using your uh, app logic uh, and pass something back that we will execute as a pipeline. So this is a very powerful feature, particularly for um, customers that have more complicated uh, pipelines. Um, but I can see that some also some really powerful use cases in here around doing sort of validations of pipelines and stuff like that as well, which um, we'll be able to have. Um, so and yes, UI extensibility will be coming very soon. Uh, stay tuned for more uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, but yeah, for everyone in this thread, give us a couple of days and we'll get some documentation up for everyone. Um, if you, like I said before at the beginning, if you are using a personal workspace today, please do share a uh, non-personal workspace in this channel. 
Uh, so we can add the feature flags for, for that because personal workspaces will not be supported for Forge um, because they are actually a, kind of a legacy feature which will be going away pretty soon. Um, so please share that information here. I'm happy to stay around for the five, 10 minutes if people have questions. Otherwise, you're all uh, free, free, to, free to go. Thanks, everyone.